Welcome everybody to this Networks for Nature webinar. Uh, my name is Anne Cantrell. I'm the facilitator for White Pink Farmers um, running these webinars. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Brian MacDonald, who's our chair for today. Um, so I'll just hand straight over to you, Brian. Thanks, Anne, and uh, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Brian MacDonald from Natural England, and I'm really looking forward to today's webinar, as I hope you are too. Uh, as Anne says, this is uh, what is uh, called Restoring Nature Depleted Britain, and it's the fifth in the webinar series Networks for Nature, facilitating collaborative farming. Uh, so it's been supported by National Lottery Heritage Fund and the South Wales Peak uh, Landscape Partnership and the White Peak Farmers Group that Anne uh, has been working with. Um, thanks very much to Anne and Liz, uh, who have uh, uh, set these uh, webinars up, uh, uh, providing the drive and coordination to, to make it all happen. Uh, so thanks, uh, as I say, to Anne and also to Liz, uh, uh, who have been making that uh, 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 work over the last uh, five uh, webinar presentations we've had. Um, details of our previous uh, webinars are all on the YouTube uh, recording site, and this one will be added to that uh, 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 after uh, we finish today. And um, today's event, uh, uh, we have um, two excellent presenters who will be uh, talking to us about restoring nature depleted Britain, uh, uh, the critical world of farming. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, hearing uh, Ivan De Klee, who's the farm manager at NEP uh, Castle Estate. Uh, who's also a facilitator of uh, 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 one of the groups that was set up uh, in 2020, the Upper Adler uh, Farmers Group uh, uh, in Sussex. Um, and uh, sadly, like all of us, uh, um, great uh, to start work in 2020, but sadly hampered uh, by the impact of COVID. So it'll be interesting to, to, to sort of uh, uh, hear from Ivan about how uh, he's been getting through that. But the group has got a big ambition, not just because of the uh, uh, the association net has with rewilding and the sort of trailblazing that started there. But the group aims to sort of reach out and improve connectivity uh, 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 in the area uh, and across that part of Sussex uh, to improve water quality, soil health, uh, woodland pasture, uh, and a variety of other uh, really important things that uh, 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 drive the ecological restoration in that part. Ivan has extensive land management experience, uh, both in England and internationally. Uh, and um, I think from the South Sudan to the Isle of Mull, Ivan, from reading through your, your bio. Um, but uh, yeah, so Ivan uh, will, will be the first uh, to speak uh, um, after uh, uh, we get going. But I'd also uh, uh, like to welcome our second speaker, Rebecca Newman, uh, from the Peak District National Park Authority. Uh, Rebecca's got over 30 years experience of uh, nature conservation in and around Britain's first national park. So we've got a, a, an interesting sort of... Uh, contrast between uh, uh, Ivan's uh, uh, focus on this uh, lowland uh, southeastern part of the country and Rebecca uh, in the Dark Peak, uh, which has perhaps got a little bit more of a variety of uh, upland bits as well. Um, so in addition to, to the, the contrast between upland and lowland and possibly uh, uh, the protected area and a non-protected area, uh, uh, I think the, the experiences of both uh, and the content of the uh, uh, webinar uh, should be stimulating. So the format will be Ivan will speak first, Rebecca will follow Ivan, each will speak for up to 30 minutes, and with 30 minutes uh, uh, for um, uh, questions and uh, contributions. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is an exciting time. It's almost, uh, I was speaking to Ivan and Rebecca at the start before we got going, just saying that between the huge range of challenges we face, it's enough to make you run for the hills and uh, 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 you know, but actually the other side of it is the opportunities it creates and uh, as I say, despite it being a challenging time, there's some fantastic opportunities coming ahead and I think we'll be uh, uh, informed uh, by uh, both Ivan and Rebecca's uh, contributions. So yeah, restoring nature depleted Britain, the critical role of farming. Over to you Ivan, if you're ready, and I'll shut up. Thanks Brian, thanks. I am, um, I'll just share my screen. I am... Um, Better start by saying, although I wish I was the farm manager, I'm not the farm manager at NEP. I am. Um, everything else you said was accurate, but I am. Um, I do a range of different things. So, if a, a quarter or a third of my time is spent as the facilitator for the Upper Ada Farmers Group, the other three quarters is spent in the NEP um, team at the NEP office working on this idea of a landscape scale corridor from NEP down to the sea working with farmers who might be shifting to a wilder system, offering them some advice and consultancy, trying to understand natural capital 
and what natural capital means for NEP as a land holding, what it means for the farmer cluster as a, for the facilitation fund group as a uh, group of land holdings, what it means for rewilding and nature conservation on a national scale, just trying to unpack all of these ideas, fully understand them and then be able to share what I'm learning, which um, you'll have to decide whether <laughs> I'm managing or not. But uh, we have got a farm at net now, an extra 350, 400 acres of land outside the rewilding area that has gone into a regenerative farm, which I'll touch on a bit later. But Russ Carrington is the farm manager of that. Um, I wasn't offered the job, but hey. <laughs> so my presentation will be tr trying to basically look at how NEP is approaching connectivity um, within the estate uh, as part of a farmer, farmer group and the idea of this landscape scale corridor. So I'll try and answer what does connectivity mean or how do I understand it? Um, what's a corridor? Is it a wild area, big rewilding project or is it a permeable farmed landscape? Uh, first, I'll present a vision for the English landscape that my boss Charlie has put together with an artist, the first slide you can see in the background. And I'll talk a little bit about the farmer group uh, funded by Natural England, um, what we do or what we'd like to do perhaps, um, look at the regenerative farm and the decision-making that's going on there regarding connectivity and then to talk about the corridor. So I'll just go through each of these and, and um, most of my slides are pictures and maps, so hopefully not too heavy. And if I start going over 30 minutes, I've got 30 slides, um, I've probably already used up two minutes. Brian, you just have to butt in and tell me to hurry up. So this is um, what some people might imagine a nature corridor. I think this is a shot from the US. You've got a very intensively farmed landscape and a strip of nature. It looks like a corridor, it is a corridor, but I'm gonna try and analyze if that's really what we need in the UK. Um, and it you may maybe in part, but uh, I'll first present Charlie's vision. So this I think is a, it's a place in the Midlands. He found a Google image and then worked with a, in a Dutch ecologist to turn it into a cartoon. And what you can see is our green and pleasant land as we know it and as we love it. And you can maybe have a, a rewilding area over here, a high nature area over here, maybe one in the distance up in the peaks over there. But what you also have is fairly intensively managed hedgerows, quite intensive farmland, um, straight roads, chopping the landscape into one, two, three, four, with the canalized river going through it. So what I'm going to try and do now is imagine the landscape in 10, 20, 30, probably 50 years time, using things like natural capital and elms and all the rest of it to, to fund that change. First thing is the corridors. It's connecting this nature area and this nature area, and you're going to build high nature value completely. I mean, and remember, this is a vision. This is a dream. It's a long way off, but it's just if we get thinking about these sorts of things, then we can probably start to achieve even small steps towards them. And we're thinking about nature recovery here. Um, and so you've got green bridges in here. Green bridges in here probably cost about five million pounds each. So it's no easy feat. Um, but you're, what you're doing there is just connecting the high nature value areas. We have about two or three green bridges in the UK, I think. And this is just a load of pictures from around the world. I think the Dutch have nearly 100. The Spanish have got loads. We're, we're a bit behind the curve on the nature bridge idea. So it's not like it's not possible. It's just we haven't got there yet. Next, you're beginning to let your hedges bloom out. You're letting them grow out a bit. You're on a longer cutting rotation. You're basically managing your wildlife, the wildlife you have already. And most any of the farmers on today's uh, webinar, most of you, if not all of you, will be doing those sorts of changes or you will have been doing it for decades, centuries anyway. But what we're allowing is nature to use the corridors that already exist, the hedgerows, the landscape. And then this is a shift to uh, agroecological, regenerative conservation agriculture, depending on how you describe it or define it, but you're using the farmed landscape as a vessel for nature as well. So you're reducing your artificial inputs, you're building invertebrate numbers, you're intercropping, you're looking after soil health, you're doing all of these 
amazing buzzwords and um, methods that we're all talking about, we're all learning about. And you're also doing HLS style margins around your field. So now you have margins in the field, you have pollinator mixes in the field, you have the hedges working as a corridor, you have your actual crops and harvest working as a corridor, and you have your big rewilding off in the corner there and a national park over there and a, and a corridor connecting the two. This I would put in just because if anyone ever asked me what, how do you define regenerative agriculture, I tend to just point them towards this picture. Simon Cowes, a uh, arable farmer in Essex, he's not from the X Factor, and he has shifted system and you can see the soil organic carbon, you can see the soil health just so clearly between those two pictures. He's a really interesting guy, so anyone who's a facilitator who wants to talk about arable farming and soil health, look up Simon because he came to talk to our group and we had a, an amazing day. Now we're looking deeper, we're looking in here as a wood pasture system which is grazed livestock but in and amongst trees. You've got a lot of people in the landscape, um, I can't, you can't see them but there's a cyclist here, you've got people everywhere, we're beginning to share the landscape with people, we're give, delivering that public good as well and then we're thinking big scale wetland restorations you know, everything we can do to help nature back. We put the canals back. And is that the last image? Pretty much. Oh yeah, and that piece of forestry down in the corner there has gone from single species forestry crop to a mixed, it can still be forestry, but a different type of timber product, um, much better for nature and much more relevant to our systems. So, and then over here, we've got greenhouses, we've got intensification in some areas, we're still trying to produce food in this landscape. Um, and we will have to set aside some big areas for things like precision farming, fly farming, these modern technologies that we're a bit scared of and don't understand, or I certainly am. They do appear to be gaining traction, so we might have to accept that they'll exist. So you squeeze them in there as well, but put them perhaps closer to the town. So what we have now is a landscape full of life clearly um, and if it's 50 years away that's that's pretty exciting because what you've got is a farmed landscape full of food um, full of good healthy nutritious food you've got your margins you've got corridors you've got your rewilding you've got your wetlands and it's and it's an aspiration so um, it's just an interesting way to think uh, of what might be possible so back to this photo is that a corridor or is that a corridor or is that a corridor or is that one? You know, each one of those has a value. And really what we're looking at, in my opinion, is trying to combine them all. So for those of you from the uplands, that will be a familiar scene, but what you've got is patches of water, you've got hedges, you've got woodlands, you've got everything beginning to connect up. And, and then maybe in field, you're gonna start changing your management practices if you're financially incentivized to do so. If it makes sense for the bottom line, you might shift to a more mob-based grazing system, et cetera. Um, but these are the types of changes we might start thinking about if, if the money's there to, to support us to make that change. Um, I'm gonna talk about three scales of connection. The regenerative farm, and I, as I was putting these slides together, I realized they fitted quite well with ELMS, which I'm sure the Natural England team have done a lot of thinking. But uh, they, I'm not pushing elms as an agenda. I just noticed that of the three things that I've been looking at, they do fit quite well. So from looking internally at net, looking at the regenerative farm, thinking about sustainable farm incentive potentially, looking at the farm cluster, that's come out inverted. That's not what the early catchment looks like. Um, I'm thinking maybe uh, of local nature recovery in elms. And then I'm thinking of this landscape scale corridor nets here. South Coast and the sea down here, Ashdown Forest over there, I'll talk about it in a minute. And then I'm thinking maybe that could be landscape recovery, the third level or tier or section or scheme within Elms. Um, so that, they're the three bits I'm gonna talk about and try and analyze how we're thinking about them. So this is the farmer group with the Upper Aida Farmers Group. Um, this was pre-COVID. This was last September, just when we had a bit of a window to do an event. Uh, this was that Simon Cal, the soil farmer. We were on a bird identification day there. And unfortunately, as lots of new facilitation fund groups have been dramatically hampered by 
COVID and we've run a few webinars, but all in all, I'd say the greatest success is we've got 37 farmers talking to each other. Um, the smallest is 11 hectares. I think that's Paul in there. And then the largest is, is Net, the big purple blob in the middle. Um, but we've got some really interesting farmers and you, you're ranging from uh, David Exwood at Christ Hospital in black, farming uh, intensive arable and farming it very well, it's producing a lot of food to nature conservationist Charlie Burrell at NEP. And so we've got a full range of people in the group and we're all traveling this journey um, to sort of post Brexit, climate proof resilience uh, at our own paces. Well, I say, oh, I don't own any land, but um, I'm hopefully, hopefully facilitating a bit of that journey. Uh, we're focusing on things like healthy soils, turtle doves and nightingales. As Brian said at the beginning, we're looking at regenerative farming. But as you know, with farmer, farmer groups and farm clusters, it's farmer led and they're about learning. They're not about imposing anything on the farmer. So what we're doing is trying to just put ourselves in a position to understand what natural capital is, what it might mean for the future and how we might enact it. I've put that slide in because the river really connects almost every single farm in the group. Uh, and if we're going to do something collaboratively, I believe that the floodplains, I don't know if any of you know West Sussex or this part of the Low Weald, um, lots of floodplains are called lags um, and lots of floodplain meadow potential. Uh, and I think working as a catchment and using the river to, to connect us, because it already does connect us, is a, is a great way to think. Um, I'll just quickly mention, that's ragwort, as you know, um, farming or conservation, I've just written there as a prompt, but um, Brian was mentioning when they asked, when the team asked me to do this webinar, how opinions have changed towards NEP in this landscape. Uh, and certainly at the beginning, there was a lot of kickback from locals and from neighbouring farmers. And I think potentially the way that uh, NEP was presented as this uh, new way of farming, this new way of uh, farming meat was completely rejected and still is because NEP isn't a farm, it is a nature conservation project and it's a really very good nature conservation project, but it produces meat as a byproduct of that. Its primary objective is not producing food, which is what a farmer's primary objective is. And so I would say farming or conservation, I'm just saying when, I, when we started the group, NEP sent a, around Rob an email out, Jason, the manager, just as they're taking me on, um, saying who wants to join a farm cluster, we've got to do something. And the interest was huge. Lots and lots of people turned up, but there was a lot of scepticism about, are we just going to be brought into NEP's orbit? You know, they're famous now, the book's famous. We don't want to be swallowed up in that rewilding narrative because we're farmers and I have worked very hard and hopefully put my farmers minds at ease that it's not a NEP cluster it's not a rewilding cluster it's a farmer cluster of which NEP is one member and I found pretty quickly that if I was speaking to the, the neighbours I was meeting all the farmers and I and I called NEP a nature conservation project they were very very happy to praise it and say oh yeah well Charlie's a very good nature conservationist it's just not a farmer and I realized that language and semantics are so important sometimes so when a farmer's told you should farm like net they laugh into their coffee and rightfully so but when they say you know they're a nature conservation project so well yeah they're really good at that because they've brought loads of nature back so actually it's just about understanding land use rather than farm systems perhaps um, and what I'm trying to argue is that there's a space for for everything in the landscape like that vision of the, the landscape we had at the beginning. I don't know if that made any sense, but uh, that they're just my impressions. And oh yeah, I put Ragworld up because one of the main objections, oh no, Brian, don't tell me I'm already running out of time. <laughs> no, you're fine, I was just gonna agree with you. <laughs> um, and I, I put Ragworld up because Ragworld nearly de derailed the project. You know, most farmers despise it. And, I would argue there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Um, yes, it's poisonous, but the reality is not many animals will eat it unless they're very, very hungry. 
in, in a fairly poorly managed pasture or it's put into hay but it was just symbolic of all the challenges um, that net faced at the beginning and it was symbolized by rag work because it just symbolized the land abandonment and poor treatment but actually from a nature conservation point of view it's done amazingly but from a farming point of view it's not a farm in my opinion so in terms of the farmer group these are the kind of I, I call it collective action and I'll talk about the corridor in a bit which is is slightly different I'd say collective action we have the opportunity to work together we're learning farmers are coming to all the events and it's great and there's a lot of communication there's a lot of thinking to be done and I've got a picture of a water bowl a cell bunting redback shrike turtle doves one of our biggest arable farmers suggested we should to make an attempt to go zero insecticides as a group, looking at floodplain meadows partnership as a, as a way to do floodplains across the group. Um, but none of these are yet achieved. So it's a slower burn in the farmer groups because collaborating with that many people with that many different systems takes time. Um, but these ideas are through the events and through the communications drifting into the shared and collective thinking. So. I'd say we've achieved a lot in the sense that we're communicating across the landscape, but in terms of conservation action on the ground, we haven't achieved a huge amount, but that isn't really necessarily the point in the facilitation fund. Perhaps the gap is finding the funds to run these projects um, collectively. You obviously can't add them all into a mid-tier separately. Um, and it's working out how we can get these sorts of things to happen on a landscape scale, on a local recovery scale, um, and find the money to do it. And I think we're gonna get there eventually. So I'm gonna move on now to local uh, local connectivity. This is the Nepa State in, in blue and green. The Northern block is that Northern section, middle block is that middle section, Southern block is down here. And this is the sort of rewilding wilderness with the safari business and, and all of those blockbuster eco ecological headlines. And these green fields are what is now the regenerative farm. Uh, they've basically been set aside for 20 years, uh, used for heifers and bulls from the rewilding system and, and for haymaking. And so they're, they're in actually ecologically pretty good shape. Um, but what Russ, the manager, is trying to do is explore how to farm with nature. And, and going back to those definition, definitions of nature conservation or rewilding and farming, as in rewilding, you're trying to produce biodiversity and the meat is a secondary byproduct. In farming, you're trying to produce food. The biodiversity is a good but secondary byproduct. And so Russ will be trying to produce, I've got a picture of what he's trying to do. He'll be, I think he's going to have Sussex, not Longhorns, but he's going to be farming beef uh, in a year or so's time, or in a few years time, he'll be doing eggs and poultry. It's going to be a market garden, and then maybe eventually a micro dairy. And what he'll be trying to do is demonstrate how to farm with nature in a lowland grazing setting on very heavy clay. Uh, and that's it. And, we, and every decision he's making at the moment is how to build in connectivity and nature into that system. So I'll just quickly read these. He's trying to explore nature recovery on a landscape scale by connecting his land with areas of rewilding and understanding the ability of regenerative farming to build natural capital and see how nature responds and to supply obviously healthy nutritious food um, and they're the main drivers of his decision making and that natural capital side of things that will be very useful we hope in five ten years given the amount of data gathering we're doing at the moment to be able to actually demonstrate what is working for nature and for the balance but for the accounts book and what isn't so that's the farm you're looking at the rivers first then you're thinking about your uh, food trees and hedgerows, and then you're looking at how wild animals, insects, invertebrates, birds might spread out into the farm landscape from the rewilding area. And it's amazing, as soon we've got amazing dung beetle population down in the southern block, especially because the animals are outwintered and uh, are organic and kind of browsing on a lot of browse as well as grazing. Amazing, as soon as Russ's Sussex arrived, it took about two hours for the dung beetles to cross that road and colonize their dung. So, you know, nature's just ready for an opportunity. Give it a chance, it'll move. So that's the, the wider estate. These arrows, arrows are nominal, but there's a neighboring rewilding project going to happen up there. And we're beginning to see 
connection on a very uh, low, very local um, way. You've got the floodplain cross hatch there. You're beginning to see how nature can travel around this landscape. I've done that slide already. That's a no fence collar. We're working, uh, I think a few people in the Peak District to be looking at no fence too. Um, but we've got those now on animals in the southern block to measure their movements. And then Ross is actually using, using them to mob up and graze in his farm. So this is the corridor idea. And I'll try and define how it's different to the cluster. But ultimately, NEP is here. The rewilding neighbor's property is up here. There's a, an estate over here, a proper arable farmer down on the south coast there, Western estate here, and Ashdown Forest over here. And what's happened is that these bigger estate landowners have signed an MOU for nature recovery, essentially. And my task now is to connect them up, find stepping stones, find links in the landscape, and join them up to create a landscape scale corridor and that corridor is not just a continuous line like we saw at the beginning. It's that patchwork of regeneratively farmed wild areas landscape. And the first thing I'm going to do is try and find people to join the group. Um, but what I'm going to do, and I talk about it a bit later, is essentially create a project and habitat um, bank. Uh, set ourselves up so that I can go out and find funding, whether it's through Elms Level 3, uh, landscape scale recovery or if it's through natural capital I need to be able to sell something so what I'm going around at the moment is to see these estate owners and say what nature projects do you want to do on the land what shift in system from conventional ag to regen ag do you want to do and once I have that list I'll be able to go out to the market and say look who wants to fund something interesting that's the very basic concept at the moment but it's an idea it's ideas at the moment and we're working on it and what we have down here is the trawler exclusion zone in green run by uh, the council and the wildlife trust and so it's the sussex bay initiative and we're thinking okay the corridors just on just on land but they go into the marine environment as well so that's a vision again a vision document and there are lots of landowners underneath these purple lines who are not involved it's just about imagining but this work's been going on for quite a few years this is a sussex wildlife trust piece of work from six seven years ago um you know people have been thinking about this for a long time nature recovery areas this is from the nature recovery network lots of lines on maps lots of ideas not a huge amount of action mainly because it's so difficult this is a draft of the nature recovery network developed by horton district council you can see nep in the middle lots of great ideas but nothing's happening so how do we actually make it happen is it by working with people like arab um how would we pay them arab would help visualize the landscape facilitate it but how would we pay them how are we going to raise those funds is it through elms landscape recovery i'd hope we will throw our hats into the ring to become a pilot for the that top level um but who knows if we'll win it if we don't win it, 22 billion pounds, this is about six days ago, has just been given to the UK Infrastructure Bank, um, including, you'll see that little bit on natural capital, but you know, they've been given a mandate to invest in natural capital. So we all know about this money, we talk about natural capital, how does it actually work? Don't really know. So my idea is, as I said, to put together a sort of suite of projects so that I can go to whoever it is who's got the purse and say, this is what we can deliver thinking about natural capital um yours. thanks i'm actually pretty much on time i think um we're looking at government subsidy elms you all know about biodiversity net gain we've all heard about biodiversity offsetting very very similar to net gain but through businesses and corporate not necessarily developers you know buying credits basically like carbon and then carbon we are all thinking about and talking about how is it going to manifest itself so i'm just trying to stay a little bit on top of these subjects so that we're ready ultimately i'm just trying to get ready and to summarize this is groundswell where i was yesterday 
sorry that you're all not there today because it's such an amazing event. I really encourage you all to go. That's Janet Hughes on the stage. She did brilliantly, I thought, because it's not easy to answer to 200 farmers who are worried about the future. And I thought she did really well, handled it very well. And um, I would just say that the farm landscape is fundamental to connectivity and corridors. And a corridor doesn't need to mean a large stretch of rewilding. It can mean something very different to that. While there is our key though, we do need space for nature. We do need the net in our landscape, but I don't think anyone would advocate turning the whole landscape into a wild area. Um, if we work at the farm regional landscape scales, and I feel like the future is bright for both nature and food production. Groundswell is an example of that. I don't know how many thousand people there yesterday, but everyone there was ready to learn ready to make mistakes, ready to take advantage of opportunities, whether it's natural capital or otherwise. Um, and it's a, an amazing feeling being in a, an environment where everyone's very positive. Um, and I'm not saying it's easy to be positive all the time and I'm not a farmer, so I don't ever pretend to understand how it feels, but it did feel in that context, very exciting because it's sort of accepting that everything's about to change and going, okay, well, let's, Let's get on board with that and see what we can do. If Elmas doesn't develop as we hope it might, then natural capital in theory should be there to take up the slack and move us in the right direction. That's me. Um, I'd be happy to do any questions now or at the end after Rebecca, Brian, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Ivan. Uh, uh, that was super. Just, just uh, to keep the format, we've uh, asked people to log their questions on the Q&A function on the bottom right hand of the screen. So we'll come to the uh, end of the presentation then move into the discussion phase then. So I, I think there's been a few questions uh, logged, but uh, anybody who thinks of anything they want to ask Ivan, uh, uh, please uh, log it in the, uh, uh, the, the Q&A part of the um, uh, menu down on the bottom right of your screen. Um, that, that, that was really good, Ivan. Thank you very much. Uh, um, some really interesting sort of uh, uh, detail and uh, uh, description about uh, uh, the good stuff you're doing and, and some of the challenges, obviously. But a uh, uh, really nice uh, way to sort of phrase it, sort of a uh, reward in you know, nature with food and uh, farming food with nature is a sort of pretty powerful sort of uh, headline way to, to summarize a challenge. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, as you say, there's some, uh, you know, some real issues that uh, uh, the sector's facing. Uh, and I think, yeah, just, just to say, we've, uh, we've probably lost a few people because of groundswell uh, uh, being perhaps a bigger a draw on the, uh, uh, the, the sector's attention. But it may be the kind of thing we want to look into uh, making a connection with uh, for next year. Uh, and hopefully if we're in better times, uh, you know, able to get out and go post COVID, uh, as some of those opportunities uh, uh, we can accelerate and progress at pace to meet those challenges. So yeah, interesting times, huge challenges, uh, but big opportunities and some fantastic work underway as you've just uh, uh, described. So I'm going to hand over to Rebecca now, uh, who's uh, uh, from the Peak District National Park Authority, who's going to be taking us through her slides, and hopefully uh, uh, Liz and uh, uh, Rebecca have been able to sort out the technology to uh, make that all happen. So without any further ado, uh, over to you, Rebecca. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So my name is Rebecca Newman. I'm um, representing the National Park Authority today. Uh, we've been working with uh, Natural England and a group of six farmers and on a smaller scale, the National Trust, um, to explore the options for nature recovery uh, in the White Peak. For those of you who don't know the White Peak, it's essentially a limestone landscape in the southern part of the National Park. Um, and it's a landscape of deeply incised dales, which support very high quality, um, mainly ash woodland and really high quality calcareous grasslands but separating these dales is a very intensively managed, primarily dairy, um, dairy farms on permanent grassland. Um, if I can have the next slide, please, Liz. So uh, Professor Lawton identified the fact that the White Peak has the highest level of fragmentation within any, nat within any national park. Um, and just as I said earlier, you know, this is as a consequence of our high quality sites being in the dales and separated by this permanent landscape, permanent grassland landscape. Could I have the next slide, please, Liz? 
So this just an aerial photograph of the Y Valley, and you can see there the dales, and then this um, very, very green or cut green mosaic of fields. Nearly all our farmers are the sort of traditional upland family farm. So most of them will be in the order of one or 200 hectares, and that's all, some of them smaller than that. The majority dairy farms, some have moved out from dairy into beef and sheep. And very critically, in terms of the challenges that we've got, the majority of these are farming permanent grasslands. So these are grasslands that will very often stay in the ground for 20 years or more in between ploughing. Um, so they are classified as permanent grasslands. We don't have any of the opportunities for wildlife rich margins that are available in arable systems. We also have a landscape that is split up into fields by dry stone walls. So we don't even have a hedge landscape to begin with. And this gives us in many ways a landscape on the plateau that is largely devoid of nature. That's probably been a bit mean on the White Peak, but is a real challenge for nature recovery. Uh, this challenge has been recognised for a long time. So even in the first biodiversity action plan, um, at around the turn of the century, we recognised the fact that getting nature out of the dales and onto the plateau was what we really, really needed to do. The next slide, please, Liz. So we've spent a long time, uh, the National Park Authority, working in partnership with English Nature, in partnership with the Wildlife Trusts, and we've put together a, a opportunity map. So this is the map that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen with the sort of beigey green colouring. And this is what we came up with as a group of sort of conservation professionals, where we felt that there were opportunities both in terms of what the landscape presented us with, and also in terms of the land ownership of that landscape. And then the slide on our left shows um, the National Habitat Network. So this is the sort of nature recovery opportunities produced in a much more scientific way. And you can see the um, real direct comparison and the fact that these very clearly correlate between one another. Um, the red sites on the slide on the left are the SSIs. And again, this shows you the real challenge that we've got for nature recovery. Um, so we're a little bit ahead of the game of um, lots of other landscapes in that we've already got this mapping in place. Um, and it gives us a good idea of what a nature recovery network would look like in the White Peak. If we go on to the next slide, please, Liz. So, sorry, this isn't great quality. So this is a close up showing the potential habitat connectivity along the Y Valley. Um, this is the same almost as that aerial photo that I showed you before. Um, and it demonstrates the need to connect habitats across that managed farmland of the plateau. So we're going to have to do this if we want to create a nature recovery network. So however fantastic the dales might be, we're never going to join them up unless we address the challenges of the farmed landscape. And I think this really neatly um, sort of takes us back to Ivan's talk, whereby farming is absolutely critical to the recovery of a nature recovery network and that core part of the farming system. We can't just depend on these high nature value sites, in our case of the Dales, in Ivan's case, NEP. We can't depend on them to deliver for nature recovery. We have to move into the farmed landscape. And that means that farmers and core farm businesses are absolutely critical um, to success. Um, there's no other way. Um, the next slide, please. So we know that ELMS, hopefully, net gain and private finance are likely to be the main tools in delivering nature recovery. So we're at exactly the same place as Ivan is, is that we know there's these different funding opportunities but we have to decide how we're going to try and deliver this on the ground. Um, this slide um, shows some pictures showing um, hay meadow restoration. So we pretty well know how to restore habitats on suitable sites where there's appropriate soil analysis with low fertility, um, but we don't have an awful lot of those sites. So this um, intensive permanent grassland landscape 
is largely one of high phosphate and potassium levels, high ryegrass dominance. And we have very little experience of how we can deliver for nature recovery in that landscape. Um, national agri-environment schemes tend to concentrate on how we can do this in arable systems or how we deliver other public goods on permanent grassland. So it's quite good at looking at how we reduce inputs against streams and rivers for water quality benefits. But national agri-environment schemes are much less good at um, providing solutions for intensive permanent grasslands and nature recovery. The next slide, please. We also have done very little in terms of creating structural diversity within existing species rich grasslands. For those of you who know the area in front of you there is Wardlow Haycock. And this is part of the National Nature Reserve. And unlike many of the grassland dales here, we've got trees and scrub alongside really, really high quality species rich grassland. And one of the other things that we're recognizing is that we need this diversity in structure in order to create a vibrant landscape in terms of invertebrates and birds and the whole web of life. And again, we've done very little of that over the last few years. Next slide, please. So we set up what we've called the White Peak Trials, um, really in preparation for ELMS. Um, these began in 2019. And it's a partnership project between the National Park Authority, Natural England, the National Trust, and six fairly typical um, peak district upland farms. Um, most of them dairy farmers, five of them dairy farmers, the sixth the beef and sheep farmer that used to be in dairy. And the whole aim, the focus of what we're trying to do is to apply nature recovery network principles within this landscape. So we're really, using those Lawton ideas of bigger, better and more joined up um, to try and think about how we do this. So we've got a whole series of management agreements funded by the National Park Authority. So individual agreements with each of the individual farmers um, for five years. Um, we haven't got a, a official farmer facilitation group here. We're just working informally with these farmers. But as I say, the formality comes through these five-year management agreements. The trials are trials. They're trials at a local level. And we're reporting back to DEFRA through a test, um, which is also operational in the White Peak. But it isn't funded through that test. That's our reporting mechanism. Um, we've got a full monitoring programme in place, and our ultimate aim is to try and feed into ELM development. So the next slide, please. So in terms of bigger, our idea is that we should try and develop um, scrubby wildlife pasture on the, at the tops of the dale sides. So we recognise the fact these are really high fertility soils. And our aim is really to have something with a scatter of wildflowers and a scatter of scrub. So we recognise the fact that it's going to take years for the phosphate to um, the levels of phosphate in these soils to reduce. So we're not looking to create hay meadows. We're not looking to create species rich grassland. We're looking to create that structurally diverse sward with a scatter of flowers and a scatter of scrub and trees. Very expensive, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so we're looking for these in really, really targeted locations. So where they'll help extend and link the dales together. And we've set out to look at different ways of trying to establish um, this vision, this dream for the tops of the dales. So in 2019, we managed to negotiate the use of two fields at Taddington. Um, these are immediately below, above the Y Valley SSI, so in exactly the sort of location we'd wish to, to use. There were productive perennial ryegrass silage fields. The top right hand picture shows you the ryegrass there, very, very little else there apart from a little bit of white clover and some docks. So 
really, really impoverished in terms of wildlife. So we've sown a native grass stroke wildflower mix into um, this field using a number of different methods to try and trial how well these were established. And that slide on the left shows our different trial areas. Um, we have used glyphosate um, and we have used just a power harrow or a more conventional preparation of a seedbed with ploughing and power harrowing. So with and without glyphosate. And we've negotiated these with Beach Farm through an income for gone calculation. Um, and this is where it becomes a little bit frightening. So this is a beef sheep farm, used to be dairy. And we've gone through a really, really rigorous income for gone process. And we're paying them £612 a hectare um, in order to take this sort of vision forward. Um, we've gone through a similar process with three different dairy farmers. And we believe the income for gone calculation would be closer to 800 or even a thousand pounds a hectare. And that just shows the value of these perennial ryegrass fields to the farmers, even in an upland area at over a thousand feet in the Peak District. Can we go on to the next slide, please? To try and assess methods for introduce, introducing structural diversity. We've used locally harvested scrub and small tree species, which we pre-treated in different ways. And we've sown those at 90 degrees across both of the fields. Next slide, please. So this shows the establishment. Um, the pictures across the top are um, showing how it's developed over the course of 2020. Um, and there's been a very good establishment of ground cover and establishment of all those sown species. Um, the early indications, and this is, carries on even this year, is that seed over sown into the old ryegrass sward without glyphosate has the worst take of herbs. Um, but there's very little difference between the glyphosate pretreatment and the surface power harrowing compared to a traditional ploughed seed bed. And this is quite um, encouraging for us in that it shows that we don't really need this ploughing and the consequent release of carbon in order to get a species rich wall developing here. I think the message is we've got something great now, but we need to remember that these are high fertility soils and we may not be able to maintain that into the future. Um, as you've seen, the cattle were there, went on in the summertime to take the bulk out of the sward before the winter. Um, so it seems possible. The early indications are that this is possible, but as I said, very expensive and it's only ever going to be um, very targeted. Next slide, please. So in terms of managing higher value sites better, uh, in 2018, the National Trust purchased 80 hectares of land at Highfields in the White Creek Plateau. The top picture shows in a little red circle where, the, uh, where this is. So very strategic location within our habitat network. Um, and we've set up a countryside stewardship piety agreement here, which started 1st of January last year to look at ways of enhancing botanical structural diversity within botanically rich grassland. So we're looking at naturalistic grazing and we're looking at the addition of dwarf shrubs, so heather and bilberry, um, scrub and small tree species. Um, we've begun, and the picture at the right shows this at the top right, we've begun with um, adding wildflower seeds, some previous silage fields, with the aim that those silage fields it, in the end would come into this naturalistic grazing system. So we've got a herd of traditional cattle on here all year round. Um, and the picture at the bottom shows the structure of this sward um, as it went into the winter last year. So a structurally richer sward than we had before, tussocky grasslands that will hopefully be of value not just from the wildflowers, but also for invertebrates, small birds and mammals. Next slide, please. So to connect and join habitats across the plateau, we've established a number of tusky grass margins within the silage fields. 
Um, so the top and the bottom uh, winter and summer photos are the same margins. And we've established these um, very similarly to the scrubby pasture at the dale top with a mixture of plow plowing, power harrowing and glyphosate. Um, we've only taken on board three metre margins, largely because that was what the farmers could swallow. Um, many of these fields are sm very small fields. If you take in any more, you're really seriously impacting on the productive part of the field. And because three metres fits with most farm kits. So again, it's trying to be as practical as we can and fit within that farming system. Take on board something that farmers could um, could and can incorporate into their core farm. Um, so to be managed without inputs, to be managed without cutting, but grazed with the aftermath. And that's the crucial thing. So very, well, in many ways, simple for the farmer to take on board. We have had a bit of a dot problem, um, especially where ploughed. And again, it's this ploughing that we're beginning to see probably isn't the way to go. Very consoling from a carbon point of view. Um, income for gone calculation in terms of the payments. And again, we're paying £612 a hectare. I think it's important to remember that these tend to be very small areas. It's only a three metre width. So for farmers, um, we found this quite a difficult sell because in a trial basis around a single field, it's still a very small payment. Um, hopefully, if we could get people to adopt these generally across the farm, that payment could actually become quite significant and an important contribution to the farm business. The next slide, please. Um, so this is the margin at Bent Farm, um, Tissington, where there's a good mix of native and fine leaf grasses, a scatter of wildflowers and a really useful tusky sward going into the winter. And you can see the difference between the margin and the bulk of the field in that right hand slide. Next slide, please. So whilst they're not a new concept, we believe herbal lays also have a real strong potential to connect and join habitats across the plateau. So creating wildlife stepping stones. And we're really here talking about invertebrates, particularly um, pollinators. So this is a herbal lay at Great Longston, um, church farm, Great Longston. And the farmer delayed the first cut until late July, 2020. Um, where he took a haylage crop. And you can see there's quite a good cover there of um, wildflowers. So we've adapted the existing countryside stewardship prescription here. Um, the existing prescription is only targeted at uh, improved, sorry, at arable land or temporary grassland. And here, this is one of the examples of where we really struggle in that we've got a permanent grassland system here. So we've used the CS prescription, but adapted it for our needs. So rather than saying you've got to have arable, it's got to have been ploughed in the last five years, we're accepting high fertility sites, so P and K indices of two or more, and a qualification as GO1, so improved grassland. And that has had to be qualified by um, either myself or Ben Rogers from Natural England. And I think that's absolutely critical going forward because the challenge, of course, in looking for herbal lays in a permanent grassland system is that we run the risk of losing high quality sites. Um, so they've gone in across five typical white, white peak farms, trials, so we've used different establishment methods and we're using different management techniques. And our aim is that we would have flowering scattered across the plateau all the way through the summer if we can get enough farms to take these on board. So if we could have maybe 20% of fields all managed a little bit differently within everybody's unique farming system, we could have this pollinator spread across the landscape. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is the lay at Stanhill Farm, again, Great Longston, established by a conventional seedbed in August 2019. And we had problems with rabbit grazing during the establishment phase. You can see the rabbits there have grazed out the river at Plantain. 
Um, and we also had a significant spear thistle problem. Um, and I think, um, again, this was something that Ivan alluded to, and I'll come on to how we've shared ideas. We've been very upfront about the problems that we've had. Um, we had a big spear thistle problem here, um, but we've not been frightened of sharing that. And we've not been frightened about trying to share solutions and talk through solutions to that. Um, and we didn't expect it at all. No spear thistle in the previous ryegrass um, sward. So yeah, challenges, but also um, great successes. Um, Robert Thornhill at Stanthill Farm is grazing this lay um, in a rotation. So we split the field into four and he would normally graze in a 23 day rotation. A quarter is being missing one of those. So a quarter will have 46 days ungrazed. Um, and really interesting to see how that's working this summer and what the challenges are for the dairy cows of going back into that after 46 days. Next slide, please. Um, at Harley Grange, um, we did something slightly different. So in spring 2020, the field was split into different establishment strips that you can see there. And again, what this has proved is that we don't need ploughing in order to establish a herbal lay. Um, what this particular trial has shown is that we're no good at establishing it through just comb harrowing um, the sward. I think if you're clever, if you're savvy, you, if you've got the machinery available, then you can probably do this. But for the majority of our small family farms who are dependent on contractors who might or might not be able to come, um, that's particularly difficult. But again, I'll come on to that a little bit later. The next slide, please. So the Charles have the potential to deliver for multiple public goods. So as well as nature recovery, we also recognize the fact that um, we've got the potential to deliver for water quality, through a reduction in fertilizer and pesticide use, for flood control, through reduced water to runoff, through climate change, for climate change, through reduction in management activities, reduction in fertilizer use, enhanced vegetation types. And also we've got the potential to increase farm resilience. And this is something that's really important in the White Peak. We've got very free draining soils over the limestone and the herbal lays have proved to be much more resilient in the face of periods of drought. Um, so there's, there's lots of um, things that are suggesting to us that these diverse wards, and it's no surprise, will actually cope with that drought much, much better. Next slide, please. So the key finds, findings in the future direction. So it looks like we can establish diverse permanent grasslands and herbal lays on productive soils with minimum soil disturbance. Um, it's going to be a hard sell, these scrubby wildlife pastures at the top of the dales. General enthusiasm for herbal lays, but we need to have very specific um, prescriptions for a permanent grassland environment. And that hopefully we can integrate these findings into ELMS, but we're going to have to look for some additional funding from other sources. The next slide, please. So where are we going now? So we've got a further suite of trial herbal lays um, that we're about to establish hopefully this autumn with funding from Seven Trent. So we're hoping for another 20 fields. And we're going to incorporate this idea of three meter uncut margins into each of those fields. We're going to trial some unusual herbs. There's talk about comfrey. Um, we're also going to trial direct drilling, slot seeding with and without glyphosate to try and get over this issue of disturbance. coming in landscape fund we're all funding through net gain and alternative private investment opportunities because we recognize that elm is unlikely to ever have um, payments at the sort of thousand pounds a hectare that we need um, we're also looking at further forage analyses to sell our ideas and then at boundary and infield trees associated with the herbal understory. Uh, 
I think one of the other things that I really need to say, um, which I realise isn't written here anywhere, is that we, like everybody, were thwarted in our plans for sharing these ideas because of COVID. But we've begun quite an intense programme now of bringing people out to look at what we're doing and to talk to one another and share ideas and share ideas not only over what they're doing now, but other ideas for what we could do as a farmer group for nature recovery in the White Peak. Next slide, please. So I mentioned farming in protected landscapes and I was asked um, as part of this, this presentation to talk very briefly about them. Um, they have been launched today by the minister, so um, just two or three hours ago. Um, so this is a DEFRA funded programme which is to be delivered through national parks and AOMBs. Um, quite significant funding. So this financial year, beginning on the 1st of July, um, there's anywhere £50,000 to £1.2 million of actual... Um, ..the national parks, with the peak being way at the top of those. Um, funding is project-based. And what's about another agri-environment scheme, talking about something that's complementary to rather than instead of agri-environment schemes. Um, it's to run for two and a half years, 21 to March 2024. And four themes, you can't see all of this slide, sorry. So the four themes are carbon, nature, people and place. Next slide, please. Next slide. So sorry, yeah. So it's aimed at farmers and landowners and at bridging the gap between now and 2024. So helping farmers to get ready for elms. Uh, the farming funding is focused on upland protected landscapes, which is why the Peak District's at the top, along with Cumbria, Yorkshire Dales, and Nines. And that's that lost speed. Um, and then the funding formula all into party population. So funding uh, the people really about to incorporate and support farmers in supporting access on their farms. Um, guidance that's been used by Def A has given emails and numbers for all the different um, AOMBs and national parks. Um, the Peak District contact is below. Okay, so thank you very much. That's the end of me. Oh, the last slide, I think. Oh, yeah, not fitting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, it seemed like the technology was coming to some sort of natural sort of collapse there at just about the same sort of time. So uh, well done. Um, uh, some really, really good uh, uh, detail and content uh, uh, there, uh, um, which was uh, uh, very interesting to, to, to hear and see. Uh, so hopefully that's prom prompted a whole range of uh, uh, questions uh, uh, that we can take up uh, with uh, yourself and Ivan now. But um, yeah, it's fascinating just to see that commonality between the, the, the opportunity to use our net gain and uh, uh, the way in which private funding can come in. So good luck with that. It's, it's, it's going to be uh, an interesting period ahead. But uh, just, just one point that sort of um, it jumped out at me was that when it comes to the lot and sort of mantra of bigger, better, and it's more and joined, not necessarily more joined, which is you know part of what we want. We want to see things joined, but the the more we want to see more fantastic sites too. So I'd add it into your your recipe, and uh, hopefully see some uh, high quality, uh, high value nature sites uh, being produced uh, uh, as well as the bigger, better and joined. Um, but uh, I'm wittering on. So Anne, have you got um, uh, uh, some uh, good questions that you can fire uh, our presenters? Um, I certainly have. Um, so I, again, if we if we kind of jump back to to Ivan's presentation, there's uh, you know you talked a lot about hedges, um, and there's a question here about how do we change that mentality about hedgerows. We know that uh, you know across across Britain, really, hedges are either you know you've got the, those people that leave them to to sort of run wild a little bit, and then you've got the people that like the neat neat and tidy approach. How do we change that mentality of the neat and tidy approach? Do you think? Um... Money is good, um, <laughs> I, but I did, uh, I was looking earlier, uh, the Secretary of State was on the stage at Groundswell about two hours ago and 
I saw someone tweeted that he said we're now going to get, or farmers will now get paid for piffs and tiffs. So if that's true, then we farmers won't be penalised for encroaching hedges into their fields. Um, and so I guess to encourage the messiness and the untidiness and how good that is for nature is a slow, a slow burn. And I'd encourage people to come and look at NEP and you'd understand that messy equals good for nature. But in terms of actually incentivizing farmers is firstly don't penalize them for having it, which is partly the case at the moment. And secondly, um, pay them to do it. And I, you know, I can't, I can't say I understand how those mechanisms will work, but if all the chat, um, in this space, the space that we're all in is is true. Then it's going the the right the right way. That's okay. interesting. I, just just to add into to to that uh, from the discussions I'm having with uh, colleagues in the RPE, then that that shift to a less punitive penalty driven approach is very much part of um, uh, the discussion. So fingers crossed that we can get in there. You're not uh, penalised for having a, a a stock of grass in the wrong place or a hedgerow that's looking a bit. Uh, untidy. Back to you, Anne. Yeah, I was just going to ask Rebecca, actually, because it's quite different in the White Peak, as you alluded to in your presentation with the boundaries and the stone walls, um, but still critical to that sort of landscape connectivity. So I don't know if, if you've got anything that you want to sort of say on that, Rebecca, in terms of similar thinking about boundaries and their importance. I'm definitely, uh, I'm sorry, I know if you'd like to See my video I'm having real struggle with internet connection which is why I've turned it off. That's fine no problem. Talk without them. So obviously I mean we're really looking at these margins in silage fields to deliver that sort of boundary how to make our boundaries better um, and seeing that as the way. We're also um, hoping to be able to trial the use of farming and protected landscapes to look at how we get trees back along our boundaries. Um, many of the trees that used to be along the boundaries have been lost. They don't get replaced because of the um, big numbers of stock that we have in this pastoral landscape. So it's one of the challenges I think for farming and protected landscapes is putting some of these back and looking at the costings for that and how that could be incorporated into um, the new environmental land management scheme. So yeah, silage margins, boundary trees. Um, some people would really like us to start looking at lines of trees along the boundaries or planting hedges along the boundaries. And that's, I think, a big challenge for a national park where we have this very traditional walled landscape. That's quite, that's quite interesting. Um, Quite a few questions here, Ive, and, and I guess I can bring you in on this as well, Rebecca, really. Thinking about food production. So we've had questions around food production. Is it appropriate that we start to introduce some of these measures in our most productive landscapes? Uh, we've got increasing populations. Is it the right thing to do? How do we balance food production and nature? Like, it's a big question. Yeah, it's a great and important question. Um, and I wouldn't advocate a rewilding project on 10 ton a hectare land. You know, I, rewilding has only ever really been appropriate on marginal land, which is why heavy, heavy, heavy clay that we're sitting on 300 meters of it was producing some fairly low yields. Um, certainly um, you'd have to be pretty intensive to manage anything high. So uh, as they go, it's a pretty good landscape for, for nature recovery because it's not very good for farming. I don't, um, you know, we've obviously got to feed the nation, we've got to feed the world, um, but we have to have a world to live in. Uh, I don't think it should be either or, and we need to try and work out how to combine nature, you know, it's land sparing and land sharing. And I think we've got to do a lot more sharing than we're doing already. And um, it doesn't have to just be intensive in one corner and rewilding in the other. Um, and that's sort of what I was trying to advocate. But I, I fully recognise that we've got to keep producing food. Um, but just moving to a regenerative farming system doesn't mean you are going to be producing a lot less. There are lots of examples of, of high yields and high meat producing systems that are using regenerative methods to build healthy soils. So I don't feel like it should be one or the other. But I, I also don't want to 
export our problems to Eastern Europe or Brazil. I, I'm not in for that. So I saw that the, the person who asked the question said, this needs more thought. It needs loads more thought. <laughs> it's a vision and a dream and something we've got to aim for. But um, there are lots of things to, to iron out in the interim. Can I, can I just um, jump in there? Because one, one of the things that jumped out at me from the, the NEP situation was I saw uh, not so long ago uh, an announcement about uh, a horticultural uh, component of NEP, uh, uh, as well as sort of the, the meat production that's going on too. And I think um, from my observations of uh, what's happening in farming, is there's a real risk around sort of smaller farms and sort of, uh, uh, sort of the family farm type, type concept and also sort of mixed farm approach. So it is a, is a room for... Uh, uh, more horticulture and more sort of mixed farming uh, uh, to to help give some sort of substance and sort of uh, focus for uh, those perhaps smaller smaller farms or even those that are in a rewilding sort of situation that might have limited uh, uh, food production space. Sorry, I would yeah I I I agree there is a lot of space and again just because I'm buzzing off the back of groundswell some of the the smaller veg producers there working on 50 acres or. Um, even 10 acres were producing as someone from Flourish Produce just producing 800 varieties <laughs> of 40 or 50 acres and is selling direct to market and has, has grown from four acres four years ago to 50 in four years you know there are opportunities and she's doing it all a primary sort of uh, way of thinking is about nature and soil health underneath all of that so there is opportunity for innovation and and Horticulture, we're going to have a four acre market garden as part of Russ's project and looking for a local partner to run that on a sort of community style management system. Um, so, yeah, very much so. I'd agree, Brian. Rebecca, again, I don't know if you want to come in on that because the white people is, is an intensive landscape, highly productive. You've already talked about that in terms of uh, some of the costings that you've, you've you've mentioned and we'll come on to that because I know there's some questions around that but again is it is it the right thing to do in these areas where we do need to produce food is it the right thing to start I think you know what I hope I've talked about is we've looked at how we bring nature or how we trial how we bring nature into that core farming business rather than um, saying we're going to stop farming this so this is about how do we encourage people to carry on farming but in more nature friendly ways um, I think one of the crucial things here is you know how farmers reduce costs by for example the sort of you know tickling or putting their toes as it were into the regenerative agriculture sort of sphere through the herbal lays um, scenario or how they give over just little bits of their land through the silage margin idea so we're not talking about um, farmers changing the core business that they're doing. We're talking about how they include uh, measures for wildlife alongside that. Um, and that's critical for us. Um, I think, you know, on that plateau, we've got many fewer opportunities for actually the rewilding scenario because these are very productive areas. Um, but we have got opportunities for bringing nature into farming. Thank you. Okay, and, and related to that, because again, there's a, there's a question about food production and the role of supermarkets. Is it, should we be pushing the supermarkets to do more? What do we do about the, it really comes down to the supply chains and, and what we expect our food to look like in some respects. And it's that I guess the the question of quality versus quantity um but what's the role of what do you feel the role of supermarkets is in that you've talked about market gardens you've talked about um kind of local producers is that the future or is it are we still going to be re reliant on supermarkets can i just come in there i'm interested in that ala who's one of the companies that um many of our dairy farmers go to are now um, asking their farmers about nature-friendly um, farming. They're asking the farmers about their level of fertilizer use, their level of glyphosate use, their level of other pesticide use. So just as you say, you know, the supermarkets, the um, milk purchasers are, are driving this as well um, because of the public demand uh, for nature, the public demand for carbon-friendly farming. Um, so I think the 
you know, it's a dream, isn't it, that we have lots of local producers. Um, I think we probably need the supermarkets, we need the big dairy companies, um, but there are opportunities there as well. And the farmers recognise those opportunities and are looking to deliver that opportunity. Yeah, I think that I think that's true. I, I just wonder how we. Again, it's, it's a mechanism to incentivize people to go down sort of more nature recovery route. But how do we how do we. I guess it comes down to that public demand to some to some extent, but is there anything else that we can do. And, and to, to get that information to, to farmers about that, those additional business opportunities. I don't know, Ivan, if you want to, to come in there. I wish I wish I had an answer. It's a too it's too um, big. It's too big a question. You know, it's it's amazing that people like Arla are beginning to ask those questions. Uh, um, Kellogg's, Danone, the bigger brands, and I know they're not uh, necessarily supermarkets, but they're beginning. To show signs they're pushing their producers to um to produce more regeneratively and hopefully being paid properly to do so um so i i you know the emphasis would be on consumer power um about paying the right price um the farmer being paid the right price and the the consumer paying the right price but obviously i come from a very privileged middle class background so it's easy for me to say pay the right price for my meat because I can afford it you know it's, it's so complex and we could spend a day discussing it but um, I think we need to pay properly for our food ultimately and the farmer needs to be paid properly for producing the right type of food and I think if, with the more education we can do for people to understand food systems getting people onto the farm the more consumers will drive that change so uh, I, don't, I don't know how how to do it apart from buying the right stuff on an individual level. <laughs> that, that's a really important point. And I think one of the ones we want to capture, uh, possibly for a future webinar, uh, either through this series or something we might want to do uh, separately. But the, uh, the, the, the other side of um, the, the challenge around that is the opportunity. So there's a huge wave, I think, uh, partly in the back of COVID and people reconnecting with nature uh, uh, which was happening anyway pre-COVID, but been perhaps accelerated uh, and making those links. One of the things that uh, uh, we had uh, as a result uh, of um, of concern was the queues at farm gates and farm shops in the early phases of the uh, first lockdown, uh, just making that link to get stuff that might not be available on the shelves of supermarkets. So there's a there's an interesting issue around resilience, uh, uh, um, uh, education, and accessibility, and some sort of um, uh, uh, equality uh, as well because if uh, uh, on the back of um, uh, this um, re well renaissance almost of uh, food production and our relationship with nature there's an opportunity to get more people growing things more locally to them uh, uh, then that you know will help to forge the nature recovery network as well as the uh, potential sort of food resilience that might come but I think you know it's one of the areas that I'm genuinely interested in seeking uh, uh, better clarity and possibly input from the groups we've established to, to see if we can help shape that dialogue. Personally, I think there's a huge opportunity around that, uh, um, uh, making those links and providing the infrastructure to enable it. Uh, and that might fit into the sort of future food strategy that's been uh, developed as well. But say log that one for, for, for further uh, uh, activity later, uh, and um, uh, we can come, come back to it. We've got um, 10 minutes left uh, uh, of the scheduled time. Uh, hopefully we've got uh, uh, some further questions that we can use uh, to good effect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot on your vision being really fantastic, Ivan, and I have to agree with that. I think it, it, the vision is, is amazing. I think we've all got these visions for various different landscapes that we work in. Um, and there's a question here about what, you know, what are the, how do farmers, how does uh, specifically the NFU, um, what, what's their take on this? And I, again, I think Rebecca, you can come into this as well because you've talked about your trials and how how you've been able to. What was be the main driving force, I suppose, for the farmers to be involved in your trials? So it's really about how how a farm is taking these approaches. How are they seeing the visions? Do do they obviously they're engaging with it, but what to what extent are they engaging in in the, our visions? Well, um, firstly, Rebecca is actually achieving things on the ground, whereas I haven't. Um, 
made any kind of visible changes the changes that i feel like we're making a in psychologically you know moving forward with open-mindedness whereas rebecca is actually doing things which is just amazing to see um the corridor and the farmer group are quite interesting comparisons and the corridor you have these big landed estates who come up farm management from a different perspective and a different background altogether. And they are more willing perhaps to experiment probably because of financial security and because they've always been managing their land in a kind of diverse way. Whereas the farmers, it is their livelihoods, it puts dinner on the table and they are in the business of food producing. And so the change for the corridor could be quick because you've got these guys who are like right i'm ready I can, i've got enough security to try something and i can see the opportunity whereas with the farmers they can see what's coming but it's much harder to change because it's much more risk heavy um and so i would say if i showed that vision or if charlie showed that vision to people in the nfu for example i think they would say Wow, really interesting. Um, but is there enough food production? Are people being financially rewarded? It's easy enough for you to say because you're a big estate owner. You know, a lot of valid questions and valid valid points. Um, and ones that, you know, in my experience, Charlie would answer with humility and, and directly. Um, so in terms of, of take up, and reaction i'd say it's it's the same thoughts that we've had on this webinar today it's like, is it relevant how can we make it work will it pay people enough money all the all the questions that we all uh, are trying to address i suppose so it's a waffled way of saying um it's mixed <laughs> so some people love it some people think it's crazy and some people are going oh, okay well maybe maybe in a few years time if i'm paid properly to do it i'll, I'll think about it Shall I come in, Anne? I'd say um, the NFU were horrified when we talked to them about the sort of scrubby wildlife pasture on the top of the dales. Um, and it's a much harder sell to farmers. And it's a particularly hard sell because um, we're not sure where the money's going to come from for that. So, you know, it's money speaks in some of this, isn't it? And then the sort of herbal lay silage margin thing, I think farmers can see um, the benefits, especially in the herbal lays, the reduced fertilizer inputs, so reduced costs. So we're really nibbling at the edges there. We're trying to um, get them to adopt nature friendly things where it doesn't have a big impact on their farm business. So, you know, I would totally concur with what Ivan says that the farmer um, response really depends on the impact on their business and their dinner on the table. Um, we had a hard time when we went to the NFU, um, which we weren't really expecting because um, inevitably when you're setting up trials, you tend to be, be doing it with the farmers who are willing to trial. Um, the NFU and that sort of core membership is a much harder nut to crack. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, and I guess if we move on, because there's questions around, uh, again, some of what you've talked about, Rebecca, in terms of the income foregone calculations that you did um, and, and how you've derived those figures um, and whether that's based on, you know, the, the farmer's use of current fertilizers, chemical, they've said here, five-year lay systems. So how have you derived those costs? You've talked about the figures that you're, you're providing is probably not actually a true reflection of those costs. And something that I suppose that I'm kind of thinking as well myself is actually if we had a, a, a kind of polluter pays approach that's been advocated, would that actually be a bigger driver, do you think, in order to, to incentivize people to do it? Or do you think that that's the wrong way to go and it should be about reward? Sorry, those are big questions, aren't they? Uh, the, we didn't go down uh, income for gone calculation for the herbal lay. We've just taken the countryside stewardship payment. Um, that would be an interesting thing to do. I can only imagine that behind that countryside stewardship payment is an income for gone calculation, and that would be a, a, um, 
really useful thing to get hold of. With regard to the income for gone on the Dale Top Scrubby Pastures, we've gone into that in huge amount of detail and in different systems. So, you know, if that was a silage field, if it was a permanent grassland field, a grazing field, um, and we've gone down to the nth degree of what it would mean in terms of replacing that forage, um, either in terms of would they have to bring in brewers, brewers grains to replace it, would they have to buy in silage to replace it? You know, total, whole different range and different farmers addressed it in a different way, but we ended up with the same sort of figures. Um, if you're interested, I can show them to you, Anne. Um, but yeah, an interesting um, process to go through. Um, we also, because the grazing we're asking for on these pastures at the top of the dales is very low level grazing, a um, few, few numbers on a trial basis. We've assumed that the FAF value equals the um, financial benefit. So we haven't taken that into account at all. Now, if you're doing it on a bigger scale, so the sort of NEP style scenario, there would be a financially beneficial outcome from that. Um, so you might bring that income for gone costs down a little bit, but not terrifically. I can see that somebody else has asked about um, glyphosate, so using pesticides to achieve nature ends. Um, and just to come in on that really briefly, I mean, we've been looking to, you know, how do we best establish these? We're looking to establish, in terms of the scrubby pasture, something that will be permanent. So we've reckoned that a one-off use of glyphosate may well be worth the positive end result as a permanent grassland system. Answering that question for the herbal lays is a whole lot, lot harder because they'd likely to have to be replaced after four or five years. And I haven't got a satisfactory answer. Uh, history will judge that one, I think. Um, and we're getting close to the, um, the, 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 the 3.30 mark and um, uh, I've got another thing I've got to get to as well. But I'm um, just thinking in the last couple of minutes, uh, Ivan, uh, and Rebecca, have you any sort of closing words, remarks you want to want to make before we uh, uh, push off? Um, mine is just that I'm in a very hopeful mood. <laughs> I'm feeling optimistic. I'm feeling, um, you know, if you think about nature recovery, NEP is an example of how quickly it can happen: fifteen years, twenty years, intensive to abundant if you're think, thinking about food production in hand in hand with nature and soil health i was at groundswell yesterday collectively a heck of a lot of thousands of hectares in that in that event um secretary straits there today people are thinking about it we're moving in the right direction it can be frightening it can be um slow it can be very very frustrating it can be confusing but it does feel like it's the right direction. It feels an exciting time to be in the land management farming um, advisory world. So, positive note. Thank you, Ivan. Rebecca, last word from you. I'd agree with what Ivan's saying. I'd also say um, bring the farmers with you. So it's the fact that we've gone to them with ideas, but been prepared to really listen to what they wanted to do. That I think has made the difference. So whilst this might appear like quite a top-down thing, I would say it hasn't been top-down at all. It's been them saying, come on, we could do this. Why don't we try that? And that's been critical to success as well. And then sharing those ideas, but using those farmers to share those ideas rather than us being the sharers. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, last one for me is just to uh, let you know about the next webinar. I can see it's been posted up on the chat there. 8th of July, 1 o'clock to 2.30, Redesigning Food Systems. There's a lovely uh, reconnection from our connection, taking this uh, uh, discussion forward in, into that. And we've got Patrick Holden, uh, Dr. Helen Harwatt, and Will Fraser from the Food Farming Countryside Commission uh, uh, coming to speak to us then. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, real pleasure. Uh, and. Um, really good uh, 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 presentations from Ivan and Rebecca and some real substance to uh, some of the issues we're facing. So thanks, Anne. Thanks, Liz. Uh, anything we haven't answered uh, uh, directly today, we'll put on the 
uh, 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 the, the, the feedback and the recording of this session. But uh, hopefully see you next time and have a good afternoon. Keep that positivity and enthusiasm up. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll make it work. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Cheers.